Orthopedic robotics has changed knee surgery as we know it, but conventional robotic systems do not operate with a wide selection of implants, given they are usually limited to one manufacturer. That is why Think Surgical believes what has gone before is not what should go ahead. Think Surgical enables choice. They believe that implant choice in combination with state-of-the-art technology is fundamental for surgeons, hospital systems, and patients. Think Surgical's T-Mini miniature handheld wireless robotic system has unlocked the implant from the robot. Just think of the possibilities when implant decisions are made by you, not for you. Please visit thinksurgical.com, that is T-H-I-N-K, surgical.com, to learn more about the democratization of Total Knee Robotics, led by Think Surgical. We've outdone ourselves today once again on the Ortho Show podcast. This week, we're bringing you shoulder royalty. Dr. J.P. Warner is a professor at Mass General Hospital, chief of the shoulder service, over 30 years of experience in the orthopedic world. Uh, he is one of the absolute pioneers of shoulder, whether it was shoulder arthroscopy or arthroplasty. He was in the Renaissance time of when it started. He is just a remarkable professor. He has trained so many. He's been a mentor to so many, such an important part of societies, whether it's the Cobb and Shoulder Society, the uh, uh, Shoulder and Elbow Society. He's just been so integrally involved in this shoulder world. This is a great episode. He drops so many pearls of wisdom. You're going to love this episode. Sit down and enjoy. Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro. From medical media, this is The Ortho Show. Hello, world. Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of the Ortho Show podcast, where everyone knows we bring you the best of the best. We're now on our YouTube channel as well. So you get to see us, not just hear about us. I am really excited about today's episode. We are bringing you shoulder royalty. Dr. J.P. Warner, who is the chief of Mass General Hospital Shoulder Service, vice chair of quality and safety at Mass General. He's a professor of orthopedics at Harvard Medical School. He has a founder of the Boston Shoulder Institute, the Codman Shoulder Society, the New England Shoulder and Elbow Society. JP, I could go on for like literally another 25 minutes just on the intro, but we just want to say hi to you and thank you for the, taking the time to be on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Fantastic. So we always start from the beginning. We love to know, you know, so where we are brought up, you know, when did the idea become a doctor? Was there a doctor in the family? Our listeners always like to get some background history. Uh, so it's it's kind of a convoluted uh, um, story, but let me let me start. I was born in Texas, uh, in the northwest corner of Texas, in Wichita Falls, Texas, on an Air Force base in a two room house because my father was a base doctor. So technically, I'm a Texan, but I didn't stay there longer than diapers. And then I spent most of my time growing up outside New York City in the Westchester area, and then I went to school all over the map, basically. As far as the the uh, legacy for um, medicine. I'm a fourth generation physician, and and actually, my father, my mother, my grandparents. Um, kind of kind of an interesting story. My great uncle knew the Mayo brothers personally, and um, I, if you can allow me some latitude here, I'll just explain something kind of interesting. Yeah, I made a decision. I made a decision that I'd go into medicine largely because I was the first child, and that was all they ever talked about. So I had no idea about anything else. Um, to actually took me a long time to understand there was a lot more to the world than just medicine. Um, but when I was growing up, my parents and grandparents worked for a period of time in a in an office on the ground floor level with its own uh, entrance off 85th Street and 5th Avenue, perfect location in, in the city. And my mother was a psychiatrist, my father a gastroenterologist, my grandfather a proctologist, and my grandmother an OBGYN. And I decided that I would never be a doctor that involved any orifice. <laughs> and, and, and frankly, if you if you remember those specialties, uh, inside joke, they call themselves their their practice nuts and butts and odds and ends. So um, I got to ask you a question: When did the term proctologist even go away? I mean, you can't see a proctologist today. <laughs> no, they don't exist. God, God knows why anyone would want to do that job. Um, <laughs> it's probably the closest you can get to politics, perhaps. 
<laughs> we won't go there. That's stepping over the line, but no, it's all good. So, uh, so a fourth generation. I mean, I think that's fantastic. So you eliminated uh, OBGYN proctology, psychiatry, uh, and what was the last one? Um, gastroenterology. gastroenterology. Yeah. So there, there were four subspecialties that were gone. So it made it much easier for your medical school compared to most people. You, you had already narrowed it down. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you know, in my family, it was a, it was a calling. It was a way of life. It wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, making a living per se. And uh, that's kind of how I looked at it. I also decided I wouldn't go to medical school anywhere where anybody in my family had gone. Um, so I froze my butt off in Rochester, New York for about six years between medical school and residency. But that, that's uh, funny how we make decisions sometimes. Um, yeah. But, but, be, but be that as it may, it's a fascinating story because I had Three siblings, none of whom went into um, health care. And in fact, I have four kids, none of whom went into health care. Every single one of those folks is in finance. So they must have known something I didn't know, really. Well, it, it takes you to about 32, 33 years of age before you get your first real job, right? We were working 120 hours a week in residency and such. And I can recall my friends graduating from, I went to Tufts undergrad, they were doing, you know, they were doing finance at Goldman Sachs and making buku money. By the time, you know, 32 came along, they were already getting kicked out, moving on to their next job. So you never, you didn't go into medicine to set necessarily make a ton of money. It's definitely a commitment, you know, to to people to be healers and and really it's a unique process. But so you're, you're at University of Rochester for med school, which is a great city, just tremendous um, you know, back in that day too, Kodak's going on in there. There's a lot of tremendous engineers that are part of there. The the uh, Erie Canal was built. That's I love that story, right? All those engineering schools were there to help build the Erie Canal. When was when was it orthopedics? I mean, you know, that's I, I haven't heard that yet in the conversation. Sure. So you know, like most things, who do you like to be around? You know, everything is relationships. So the orthopedic surgeons back then were uh, just, they were they were good people. You know, there was a lot of fun with them. I, I, I have, however, remember one transformational um, event. And that was when, um, before I went to medical school, somehow it was arranged. My father knew Henry Mencken from New York days. And Henry Mencken was the chairman at Mass General in orthopedics. And I got to go there and watch, you know, orthopedics in the olden days. And, you know, really the uh, the, the days when it was, you know, think about the analog days, no digital anything. And the thing that impressed me was, um, you know, the flavor of the experience. I, I vividly remember that a uh, number of the senior orthopedic surgeons were very angry at Dr. Mencken because he would uh, kind of uh, torture them at breakfast conference. And they, <laughs> I've been uh, there. I've been they there. were, <laughs> they were, they were actually thinking about getting black ski masks and baseball bats and waiting for him in the garage. <laughs> and I thought this must be a fun place. I spent four years here. That'd be fine. So you were so were you in college when you went when it was able to spend some time with? Yeah, Mencken? I was. Yeah, I, I yeah. went. I went as a college student in the days when you could do that sort of thing. So you were sitting at a Mencken breakfast as a college student, getting a feel of what this whole thing was about. Exactly. Yeah. So I was a yeah. Tufts resident. You know, you guys know you would take a Tufts resident like every three months. You know, Bill Levine and I were, were co chief residents together. He always makes fun of me because I get the numbers wrong. But uh, you know, I would vividly remember sitting in that breakfast. You know, like looking down like this, you know, trying not to eat anything, and and then he was always nice to the Tufts guys. He didn't he didn't bust on us, but those were some, that was some tough times, man. You had to come, you had to be prepared. Well, I mean, I I had the luxury of not really being in the firing line. Yeah, um, at that so at that I, time, <laughs> when I arrived there, I was ready for that. But but the reality is, it was it was sort of at a movie. It was it was in the olden days when you could behave ways that you can't behave now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was it was uh, at the time it was stressful for many, but I thought it was pretty entertaining. Well, and we were providing a service back then. It's not like nowadays. Right. We were putting in IVs. We draw blood. We put it in Foley's. You know, we work in crazy, crazy hours. It's ward service. The ward service in Mass General. How many people were on, on the ward service back then? 100, 150. I mean, who knows? But it was hard work. Well. Well, it, yeah, it was. I mean, there are a lot of flavorful stories that I probably can't share here, but uh, to say the least, um, it was just uh, divide and conquer. And you would have to go down at late in the in the evening, uh, twelve at night or early in the morning, and go basement to cannibalize all the parts needed for traction to build a bed yourself in those days. And so it it was. Uh, 
it created resourcefulness, I would say, in terms of the way things went. We didn't have, in fact, this is this a really interesting story, true story. Um, I like sports medicine very much, and my my colleague didn't really like it, and he was um, doing uh, joints with Bill Harris. And in those days when everything was on paper, we just decided we wouldn't change rotations. And so he told Dr. Harris that, no, it's been approved, I'm staying with you. And I told Dr. Zarens, no, I'm going to stay with you. And nobody knew the difference. And so I got a double <laughs> sports rotation and he got a double joint rotation. I got I got kicked out of Jesse Jupiter's operating room the first day. He fired me because I went to go see a pelvic fracture with the chief resident uh, and he was doing a carpal tunnel. And Jesse pulled me into the office. He said, this is your last day at Mass General. You can leave now. <laughs> Literally, fortunately, the chief resident pulled me aside. And after I stopped crying, and he uh, he said, don't worry about it. He'll rehire you again tomorrow. But yeah. it's a, yeah. stress, a stressful place. But what an impressive learning ground, right? I mean, you had the opportunity to work with the, the greats of orthopedics at the time. I mean, you mentioned Bert Zares and Bill Harris. Well, and, uh, you know. let me, you, you haven't asked me yet, but let me tell you a true story about why did I pick shoulder surgery? Well, yeah, it's a very let's personal hear that. story. I love that. So, yeah, it involves a spica cast. Um, so, about my second year as a resident, I, I was swimming a lot and got shoulder pain. Nobody knew what it was. I saw some big names, like you said, nobody knew what it was. And so, Dr. Zarens, uh, was going to scope my shoulder and um he did and uh, one of my buddies was a resident with him and i woke up in the recovery room afterwards and dr zarens came and talked to me and i can't remember exactly what he said but the lips moved and i couldn't make out any words and when my buddy came by and i was a little bit more uh lucid i said did he know what he was doing because it was early days for arthroscopy I and mean, we're talking about the mid 80s right and my my buddy said no not at all. So from that day forward, I tell Dr. Zarens he inspired me. I love I, that. I, I decided I'd become a shoulder surgeon. And long story short is I wound up several surgeries later having a what they did in those days, which was an open capsular shift. And they put me in a half body spica cast in July. Oh, Jesus. And I took call at Children's Hospital with a spica cast. Try to start an IV in an infant wearing a spica cast. But that's what my life was like for that period of time. So, so I love it. So you you make it through the gauntlet of the Harvard combined orthopedic residency, which at the time was you know very difficult. Uh, you you get tortured in the operating room. They put you into a shoulder spike a cast, and you say, "We need to learn how to take care of the shoulder." All right. So, right. But, but so, but your fellowships are interesting because you did did you do some extra time at Children's doing sports too before doing your yeah, shoulder? I uh, well, I did, I, I don't know exactly, remember exactly the timing, but I did a fellowship program in pediatric sports medicine with a guy named Lyle McKaylee. Some guy. Uh, very, very interesting experience, really great surgeon. And, uh, then in those days when we were chief residents, we actually ran a trauma service. There was no real trauma service. Sure. Sure. And then I went off to Europe for six months where I worked with Christian Gerber and, uh, Rolly Jakob and Reinhold Gans and, some people may remember Jan Gilkvist, who was a knee surgeon in Sweden. I lived there. I lived in Paris and did research there. And then I spent the the next year at HSS um, with Russ Warren and colleagues. Uh, Dan Cooper was my fellow resident there. And I shared an office with Steve Aronofsky, names that many of the people listening here, they won't know. But if you look them up, you'll be quite uh, impressed with who they were and what they did. Aronofsky was just an incredible um, scientist when it came to ACL surgery and all of that. So that yeah. that's kind of the journey that I took before I started in practice. And the practice part of it was the most interesting because that's when I met Freddie Fu. Yeah. And uh, if people remember Freddie Fu, there was nobody as technicolor as Freddie Fu. Yeah, we, we miss him dearly. Um, and, you know, it's fascinating, just the names and the experiences. You know, Steve Arnowski is now this amazing, you know, he's a veterinarian. Like, if you want to do anything biologic, you've got to have, you know, Steve's, you know, thumbs up on that project. And, uh you know, just just true. And Dan Cooper, you know, the, the team physician for the Cowboys. I mean, you know, just tremendous names. And then, of course, you go work with uh, Chris Harner and Freddie Fu and you decide how did you. So, I mean, you've trained at some of the, the, the best places around the world at this point. You have a great pedigree. I'm sure you could have opened up shop pretty much where you wanted to. What was the decision making on why going to the University of Pittsburgh? I know that you you were the leader of the shoulder service from day one, I'm assuming. No, you're, yeah, that would be wrong, actually. It was kind of interesting why to do that. Um, you know, I mean, each of us has a different 
a roadmap that we see for our lives and we don't really understand, but we're building our brand. Um, that's, that's an important point. And so in those days, I, I had a burning desire to answer questions that affected me personally and patients that I saw. And I saw all sorts of problems for lack of understanding of the shoulder. It was just an incredible opportunity to make a difference. Um, that said, I looked all over. And in those days, of course, it was all on phone and analog. You know, it wasn't really digital. You didn't email people. Um, the thing that most impressed me is, first of all, I didn't go there. Freddie Fu came to New York and came to the lab when I was there. And he came in and he was, you know, acting like typical Freddie Fu. It was hard to understand. And he said, I need a shoulder guy. I need a shoulder guy. And uh, <laughs> so I visited and I actually met Jim Herndon, who some of the some of the viewers may know who he was, but he was just a, a bigger than life, amazing person. He made my career. And there was something that clicked for me that said, I need to work for this guy. And if there's one important message I can tell people is find a good boss. It's not that easy. And uh, he made a huge difference in my life. And so when I showed up there, I was part of the sports service because I'd done sports fellowships as well. And when it came time to create a shoulder service, he was the one that decided, Hernan did, that I would be chief of the shoulder service and run the lab and all that other stuff. Uh, Pittsburgh was uh, in its renaissance then in terms of what we could do. We had Savio Wu. We had an incredible lab. Freddie Fu was going a million different directions. Um, you know, I'll never forget that when we won the Kappa Delta Award in the lab that Freddie Fu created, I said, Freddie, we won the Kappa Delta Award. He said, great, what did we do? <laughs> so he was everywhere. And, uh, and so it was a great opportunity for me, but I can tell you that it wasn't exactly the most wonderful opportunity for my wife um, because she grew up in Boston. So it was, a, it was a, and you know, that's always one of the major things that uh, as we decide, right? I mean, the work-life balance, being able to identify, you know, your career is on the rise and your, your wife has been there through the entire process of this whole thing. And and you got to figure out a way to keep her happy as well. I mean, one of my favorite, favorite lines from Freddie Fu is, you know, you want a second opinion, what do you do? You ask Freddie Fu again, right? I mean, it's just yeah, one of these yeah. larger than life, yeah. you know, yeah. individuals yeah. that just uh, I'm sure must have been just truly amazing to work with. And then, so did Dr. Herndon go to up to Mass General before yeah, you so, made the so, move? So let yeah. me so let me explain. Yeah. Um, first of all, going there, sometimes our journey is not the way we anticipate. We have to go all the way around a long way before we get to where we need to be. If I didn't go there, I never would have gone to Mass Journal. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing here. Um, as it turned out, and, and I had met great people. I mean, I trained people like Brian Cole, Larry Higgins, and many, many more that themselves are are exceptional individuals and great leaders and you know great thinkers. Um, that was the opportunity of that Renaissance period. Jim Herndon um, was originally hired by the Harvard you know, orthopedic group to be the person to help them find the next chief. And ultimately that was him. And when he went, he came to me and he asked me, you know, do you want to come? There's never been a shoulder service there per se. When I told my wife, she said, you got two choices, a long commute or a short commute, because I'm moving with or without you. <laughs> um, and, and that was how I came to yeah. Boston. Yeah. So no. I, I, it's doubtful I would have gotten there if Fernand had not gone. And then the gravitational force pulled me along. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I didn't even really appreciate it, but, you know, still 1998 is now shoulder arthroscopy starting to blossom, shoulder replacements coming into its its space, the reverse total shoulders coming pretty soon. So it was a real unique opportunity to start a shoulder service at Mass General Hospital. This is not just a, this is a big job for you, you know, for sure. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't be remiss. I would be remiss if I didn't say the, the most important ingredient in my success uh, other than having a great boss with Jim Herndon uh, or my partners. And my first partner was Peter Millett. My second partner was Larry Higgins. And now my third partner is Basim el -Hassan. So you can do the calculus on that in terms of brain power and, and creativity and such. When you're in that kind of environment, it's like the Medici environment where brilliant people come together and magical things happen. Um, it was just really a wonderful period of my life. I, there was punctuated by depression when people left to go other places like Peter did, but then Larry came along and then Larry left and now I have Basson. But the point is that you can't do things yourself. If you have good partners, you always do something that's that multipl that multiplies. It's not even additive. No, that's 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 wonderful sage uh, advice and, or counsel, I should say. And 
And, you know, what's interesting, it's almost like the Belichick, you know, coaching tree, you know, eventually these guys have to go off, right? I mean, they're going to be the next JP Warner of wherever they're going or their own version, obviously. I love the fact that you talked about brand, right? I think that brand, you know, it, when when we were growing up, right, you threw a shingle up on the wall and you shook some hands at the primary care doctors. There was no Google. You couldn't, you know, you, there was no reviews or going online, any of that stuff. But nowadays, there really is. And, and to embrace technology within medicine, which I want to spend some time with you about, because I know you're very passionate about that, um, I think is really remarkable. I think we're, there's a true renaissance happening right now with medicine and technology that's going to really take us to the next level. Yeah, I think I think there are two things. You know, I'm towards the end of my career now after about three and a half decades of doing this. And um, I think you're lucky if you are early to some things. So I was early to arthroscopy. I was early to arthroplasty, relatively speaking. Um, you know, and, and now I'm early to the digital age. And um, along the way, you go through an interesting metamorphosis when you try to reinvent yourself in order to be fresh in your thinking. And it isn't easy. It's really hard. In fact, I went to business school about five years ago, completely changed the way I look at things and realized how Poorly, I, I considered things in such a narrow view. You know, when you when you become a, a specialist, everything narrows. You you get tunnel vision. When you become, well, at least if you go to business school and do the right things, everything broadens, and you realize that you can take things from over here and over there and put them together and create tremendous value that you otherwise wouldn't have any knowledge of had you not taken the time to try to understand and reinvent yourself that way. But point being that we're now in the digital age, and um, it's it's been uh, a really exciting journey to be part of the evolution of AI and virtual reality and mixed reality and all these things, not just from an academic creative point of view, but from a business point of view. And um, I've been very lucky to be surrounded by smart people and find myself, I always say, there's another bit of sage advice for everybody. If you find yourself in a room where you feel like you're the smartest person, you need to be in a different room because you're not going to get anything meaningful done. What you need to do is you need to be in a room of people smarter than you, everybody working towards a particular purpose. And to be fair, that's the nature of uh, business and especially startup companies, which is um, something that has been the you know, last five or six years of my life, maybe even a little bit longer than that. That That is very, very Exciting, and it's the antidote to burnout, at least in my way of thinking. Yeah, the cross-pollinization of the things that you can see with other people in a room that think about things differently, I think is where, you know, the relationships that you need to bring together to create a successful startup company, uh, you know, eventually, you know, it's passion to be able to heal patients, to be able to care for patients, but you've also developed tremendous knowledge over those three decades. And so uh, the idea of, of the idea of startup companies where you can bring new ideas and take time out of clinical practice. It keeps you excited. I know for me personally, my podcast, my ortholaser, medical device design, professional education, all these things yeah. are what yeah. keeps you interested in wanting to go back and still care for patients. So, and you know, look, you are you you are a true entrepreneur. I mean, I, I think you're involved in something over like 17 companies, you know, over your career as far as these startups are concerned. And you know, I look at this and I, you know, I, I know that you're involved in Precision OS and I'd like to talk a little bit about that from the standpoint of education, about how the process of education is going to change in the digital world. You know, Sharif Bechet, myself and Danny Goyle, Danny's in Vancouver, Sharif's in Detroit, I'm in Boston, and we're sitting on the in this virtual world operating together and like fisting each other and like high five, I mean, with tactics. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, there's there's a lot of moving parts here, but to be fair, um, we're going to see a transformation going to go very quickly. And think about this. Moore's law basically says that computer processing power doubles about somewhere every, every 18 months or so. Um, AI is moving more than twice as fast as that. So it's hard to even imagine where it's going to be. Now, we're starting to peel back the layers and see what it can and can't do and what the dangers are. And they're, they're not the sinister dangers of, you know, taking over the world and all that. They're just some major errors that AI can make that may lead you astray unless you have the proper, you know, proper oversights in place. But that said, it's going to become an extension of us and make our lives much easier from the standpoint of many of the mundane things that we do for which we're not well 
you know, suited nor appropriately compensated. And uh, that's just part one. Part two is think about all of what we're doing now with robotics and navigation and this sort of thing. And then think about an AI conscience that oversights that and drives that, the boundaries that it creates so that we don't make errors. You create enormous value when you create processes that avoid errors, where you engineer those processes to avoid errors. I mean, that's a high performing organization. That's what they do at NASA. Um, and that's where I think healthcare is going to go. And you know, orthopedics is probably most suited to this because we have short episodes of care with very clear endpoints. It's not that complicated. And uh, along the way, we just want to avoid the problems and, and do things reproducibly. That's that's what the future holds, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's so incredibly well said. I mean, I just think, you know, I, I, I went in, you know, my arthroscopy today with this tower with wires coming out of it and a TV screen. And I'm like, you know, why, you know, why is it taking so long? But I'm truly excited you know, we had Stefan Abini on uh, not too long ago from UCSF, and his he's really bringing the digital world in as well. I, I just am. I think that it's it's taken a long time to get there, but we're now embracing that technology. And I know you've been integrally involved in many of these companies as they're starting in their process. Yeah, let me let me just do. It. You mentioned uh, virtual reality, so I want to make sure to people understand there are a number of companies doing this. I just happen to work with one of them, and I think it's a very broad area. And to be fair, most of the focus has been on other things that seem more sexy, like mixed reality and augmented reality and all these different things. But the the value of virtual reality is quite remarkable. First of all, you flatten the world. I can tell you that um, I just got back from Saudi Arabia. And before I went, I did a, a virtual reality uh, operative session with the shoulder surgeon in Saudi, along with Danny in Vancouver and um, presented a video of what we did before I even arrived when we were in different places. Now, the fascinating part of that is if you think about the cost savings, there's lots of data coming out now demonstrating that the cost savings over cadaver training is enormous. And that the, the skills that you develop are significantly better than if you just watch a video. Um, and if you look at it from a business point of view, imagine you have a lot of inventory and you want, need to sell that inventory at, at distant locations. You can actually meet with somebody in the metaverse. They can try these things in the virtual reality world and then decide if they want the product that you have. So your customer acquisition costs go way down, which is a big part of the cost of, of doing business. So all of these possibilities exist. And it's a little bit clunky right now, but it's getting more and more streamlined as each company comes in and iterates new versions of this technology and competes with one another. And pretty soon it's going to become very much seamless. In fact, we're going to have um, probably glasses at work, virtual reality and mixed reality. You just toggle between either one you want, whether you want a hologram in the real world or whether you want to be in the virtual world. Yeah, it is just unbelievable what's coming down the pipeline for sure. You know, listen, JP, I could go another hour and a half with you, you know, on this conversation. I just, uh, you know, we usually keep it down to 30 minutes. We're beyond already. I mean, I just, I personally want to thank you for, for for so many things. I mean, first and foremost, having the passion to be a pioneer in the world of shoulder. Literally, I love that story about you having been operated on by one of the greats, and he looks at you afterwards and really doesn't know what, what was supposed to happen. And then you take that vision and then develop it and then train so many other physicians along the way who have then also contributed to the process you know, your, your education, your contributions to societies, to the literature. I mean, we could go on and on, but, you know, what a pleasure it is to have you on today, JP, and your stories have been fantastic. And I think we're definitely going to have to get you back on again to hear some more. Can I leave you with one final thought for your viewers? And that is that uh, take a moment and, and Google Codman Shoulder Society, because I have a blog that it's all about everything we've just been talking about, business, personal development, branding, et cetera, that might be of interest and it's free. So just think about that. In the, in the world where there's so much noise, I curate that noise into things that I think my colleagues and friends might find of value. It has been absolutely wonderful to share this time with you, JP. We thank you for all you've done in orthopedics. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro, host of the Ortho Show. Till next time. <laughs>